be here with you today um, to talk a little bit about this topic of investment versus empowerment. Um, you've all been told to relax, but I think I need to take a, a leaf out of your books of advice and relax myself. So please excuse me if I stammer just a little. So first of all, definitions. The Oxford Dictionary has the following to say about the term investment. In general, to invest is to allocate money or sometimes another resource, such as time, in the expectation of some benefit in the future. For example, an investment can be in durable goods, in real estate by the service industry, in factories for manufacturing, in product development, and in research and development. Now let's look at the term empowerment. The Oxford Dictionary once again defines empowerment in the following way. Authority or power given to someone to do something in very simple terms. So let me give you an example. You can use this word thus. Individuals are given empowerment to create their own dwellings. That's one context in which you can use this term. Or you can say something like a foundation to promote economic empowerment for poor countries. I'm sure you get the gist. Many use this term empowerment without really understanding what it means. I'd like to define and explore empowerment in this context as a multi-dimensional social process that helps people gain control over their own lives. It's a process that fosters power in people for use in their own lives, in their communities, and in their society by acting on issues that they define as important. But what is empowerment really? What does it look like? How can we recognize it? How can we evaluate empowerment? How can we talk about it with others who are interested in empowerment? So many use uh, this term to cope with its lack. Oh, OK. All right, thank you. There you go. I have not been empowered te technologically tonight, but I'm sure you'll bear with me. So as I was saying, many use this term to cope with its lack of clear shared meaning by employing the concept very narrowly, using only their specific scholarly discipline or program to inform them. Others don't define the term at all. As a result, many have come to view empowerment as nothing more than the most recent popular buzzword to be used to bring new money to old programs. We, at least at Tingati, try and maintain that empowerment is much more than that. Empowerment is a process that challenges our assumptions about the way things are and can be. It challenges our basic assumptions about power, helping, achieving, and succeeding. To begin to demystify the concept of empowerment, we need to understand the concept broadly in order to be very clear about how and why. The one element that immediately jumps to mind when we talk, to, talk about empowerment is the issue of power. What is power? Who has power? How does one get power? And how does one keep power? And how can power be shared? Let's talk a little bit about power. At the core of the concept of empowerment is the idea of power. The possibility of empowerment depends on two things. First, that empowerment requires that power can change. If power cannot change, if it is inherent in people or positions, then empowerment is not possible. Nor is, it, nor is empowerment conceivable in any meaningful way. In other words, if power cannot change, you cannot have empowerment. Secondly, the concept of empowerment depends upon the idea that power can expand. This second point reflects our common experiences of power rather than how we think about power. To clarify these points, I'd first like to discuss what we mean by power. According to Weber, academician, 1946, he said that power is often related to our ability to make others do what we want, regardless of their own wishes or interests. Traditional soci social science emphasizes power as influence and control, often treating power as a commodity or structure divorced from human action. When conceived in this way, power can be viewed as unchanging or unchangeable. Weber also gives us a key word beyond this limitation by recognizing that power exists within the concept, a context of relationships between people or things. Power does not exist in isolation, nor is it inherent in individuals. By implication, therefore, since power is created in relationships, power and power relations can change. Empowerment is a process of change. 
This, and only then, does this become a meaningful concept. Now, a brief exercise that we can do to uh, make this importance and uh, the importance of this discussion very clear. Quickly, in your mind, list three words that immediately come to mind when you think of the word power. And we can share them a little bit. What, what do you think of when you think of the word power? Let's make this interactive. ESCOM. ESCOM. <laughs> or the lack thereof of power, that could be, ironically. Uh, Viagra. Viagra. Power. Influence. Influence. Anything else? Control. Yes, absolutely. So often words that involve power revolve around control and domination. Focusing on these aspects of power limit our ability to understand and define empowerment. The concept of empowerment also depends upon power that can expand, as I said, our second state. Understanding power as a zero sum, a negative sum, as something that you get at my expense, cuts most of us off from power. A zero sum conception of power means that power will remain in the hands of the powerful unless they give it up. Although this is certainly one way that power is experienced, it neglects the way power is experienced in most interactions. Another brief exercise that we can do highlights the importance of the definition of power that includes in, uh, expansion. Answer for yourself the following questions. Have you ever felt powerful? Was it at someone else's expense? Or was it with someone else? Just think about that. Contemporary research on power has opened up new perspectives that reflect aspects of power that are not zero sum, but are shared. Researchers and practitioners call this aspect of power relational power, coming back to that word relationships. Gaining power actually strengthens the power of others rather than diminishing, dimin diminishing it such as occurs with domination or power regarded in that sense. Kreisberg has suggested that power is defined as the capacity to implement, simply. Power is the capacity to implement. This is the definition of power as a process that occurs in relationships that gives us a possibility of empowerment. As a general definition, we at Dingate, however, we suggest that empowerment is a multidimensional social process that helps people gain control over their own lives. It is a process that fosters power. That is the capacity to implement in people for use in their own lives, in their communities, and in their society by acting on issues that they define as important. We suggest that three components of our definition are basically uh, basic to any understanding of empowerment. The first is that empowerment is multidimensional, social, and it's a process. It is multidimensional in that it occurs within sociological, psychological, economic, and other dimensions. Empowerment also occurs at various levels, such as the individual level, at a group level, and in the community at large. Empowerment, by definition, is a social process, since it occurs in relationship with others. Empowerment is a process that is similar to a path or a journey, one that develops as we walk through it. Other aspects of empowerment may vary according to the specific context and people involved, but these remain constant. In addition, one important implication of the definition of empowerment is that the individual and the community are fundamentally connected. I want to talk a little bit about the interconnection of individuals and the community. Wilson 96 pointed out that recently, more researchers, organizers, politicians, and employers recognize that individual change is a prerequisite for community and social change and empowerment. This does not mean that we can point a finger at all of those who are less powerful than us and tell them that they must change to become more like us in order to be powerful or successful. Rather, individual change come, becomes a bridge, a bridge to community connectedness and social change. To create change, we must change individually to enable us to become partners in solving the complex issues facing us today. In collaborations based on mutual respect, diverse perspectives, and a developing vision, people work towards creative and realistic solutions. We see this inclusive individual and collective understanding of empowerment as crucial in our programs, with empowerment as a goal. It is the critical transition or interconnection between the individual and the community. Now, 
I've long questioned the traditional approach of development, where donors and governments invest in basic health, targeted aspects in the education sector, and access to food in developing countries, with the hope that perhaps the beneficiaries will eventually become self-sufficient. While all assistance is to be acknowledged and appreciated, we need to rethink the ways in which we empower others. We must revisit our definition of de development and the tools that we employ to achieve it. We need to give from the perspective of empowering through investment in the recipient rather than making them dependent. If we support people in a more sustainable way by increasing access to economic e opportunities, they can afford to pay for some of those basic goods and services that governments and organizations sometimes struggle to provide. We need to give from the perspective of, of investing in the recipient rather than making them dependent. When we invest in jobs and economic opportunity, beneficiaries will lift themselves out of poverty. This approach fosters the spirit of enterprise and will preserve dignity and reinforce self-reliance. Tony Alumelu once said that investment must be long-term and target strategic sectors outside of extractors, extractors in Africa, which spurs local value-added growth to invoke a sense of shared purpose. He called this Africa capitalism, which calls for regulatory reforms where necessary, more opportunities for investment in industry and infrastructure, and a renewed focus on entrepreneurship. Supporting entrepreneurship means creating SME-friendly policies and regulatory systems that improve the enabling environment for millions of potential job creators to actually succeed. These are the people who can fuel our future, but who often lack the capital, the training or the support to grow their small businesses to the next level. One in five people on the continent do not have a bank account. And in Malawi, many do not have collateral, collateral or even identification. And as a result, access to credit, insurance, and other financial services remains a major hurdle for SME expansion. To realize the dividend, countries must invest in the empowerment, education, and employment of their young people. There are 1.8 billion young people in the world today, representing a staggering amount of human potential. Yet, too many of them are trapped in poverty, with few opportunities to learn or to earn a decent living. Malawi has the largest population in its history at the moment of youth, accounting for 70% of the total population. The UNFPA's Population and Development Conference in 2016 highlighted that youth under the age of 35 account for 70% of the population and 46% of the population consists of young people under the age of 15. Malawi's mean age as of 2016 was 17 means that they'll be just ready for elections next year. The population will continue to grow quickly as the current generation of children and adolescents grow up to have children of their own. Even if fertility rates decrease, the size of the youth population is projected to increase by 9.3 million by 2025 and 13.9 million by 2050 in this country, guaranteeing that Malawi will have the majority youth population for the next 40 to 50 years. Roughly two-thirds of this population is under the age of 25. Completion of secondary school is low amongst adults aged 20 to 24, particularly for girls. The UNFPA's Population Development Conference also revealed that only 8% of the population is expected to attain tertiary education. 8% of this entire population. Increasing investment in young people is key. This includes promoting quality education that prepares them for future opportunities. A diversity of training will be needed, from quality primary and secondary schools to technical training to two-year colleges and research-intensive universities such as UNICAF. With increasing emerging needs for young students to juggle work and study, innovative, flexible tertiary education institu institutions such as UNICAF that give, pe give people the ability to attain tertiary education and earn and conduct business <coughs> are increasingly emerging as game changers. Traditional models need to make way to progressive methodologies such as those employed here that open the world up to people by being creative and deliberate about creating global and local synergies. We need to innovate and be dynamic in how we engage in the education sector and how the education sector synergizes with other sectors at all intersections so that we're weaving a social fabric 
of progress that is cohesive and leaves no one behind because of its rigidity. Let me, however, put a fly in the ointment at this juncture. So, according to the New York Times, Donald Trump's transition team wanted to know the following. Why should we spend funds on Africa when we're suffering here in the US? Curiously enough, most Americans probably would have agreed with Mr. Trump for once that this was a real question. But they all share, in my opinion, at the very least, an entirely false premise as far as investment in foreign aid goes. In the truth, according to Trudeau, and Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada, he said that we've been ripping off Africa for decades. And he had the following to say as well. America and the rest of the rich world have actually been ripping off Africa for the past 700 years, ever since the Portuguese began the slave trade. All the while insisting that Africa has been, beneficiaries to this re has been a beneficiary to this relentless exploitation. It's been one of the great hoaxes of the past millennium. Slavery and the slave trade upon which Western Europe and United States developed their economic superiority was said to be positive for Africans, whose innate inferiority meant that they had no capacity to run their own lives. Ring a bell? Colonialism, in turn, was the West's ostensibly philanthropic attempt to give Africa with Christianity, civilization, and commerce in return for making possible Europe's assorted empires. Near colonialism, which has operated for the past 65 years since the West first gave their African colonies freedom, is at the stage that we've all lived through. During this period, according to Western mythology, Africa has been the problem to which the generosity of the rich world is the solution. In 1973, a publication of the groundbreaking book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, by Guyanese academic activist Walter Rodney, said that the, Euro, the, said that the, Europe, uh, the European fairy tale was definitively exploding. The title said it all. The title was, Africa's multiple woes were a function of deliberate policies of exploitation by Europe's colonial regimes. He had more to say. He said that the US-based global financing integrity examining all the financial resources that they get transferred between rich countries and poor ones each year, including aid, foreign investment, and trade flows, as well as debt cancellation, workers' remittances, and unrecorded capital flight. The conclusion was categorical. The flow of money from rich countries to poor countries, including most of Africa, pales in comparison to the flow that runs in the other direction. In 2012, the last year of the recorded data, poor countries received a total of 1.3 trillion US dollars, including all aid, investment, and income from abroad. But in the same year, some 3.3 trillion flowed out of them. In other words, developing countries sent 2 trillion more to the rest of the world than they received. Since 1980, these net outflows add up to a staggering total of 16.3 trillion. That's how much money has been bled out of the global south, including Africa, over the past few decades. And yes, I did say trillions in dollars. Add in the massive corruption enabled by Western institutions and perpetuated by institutions and individuals at a local level, plus the violent coups and conflicts that the Western interests facilitate, then there's only one conclusion. Rich countries aren't developing poor countries. Poor countries are developing rich ones, sometimes. This is food for thought when we think about how many empowerment-centered programs are designed and implemented by foreign organizations and corporations. We may ask how much of it is being truly invested in this empowerment and what are the tangible outcomes. Although access to timely information about programs or about government performance or corruption is a necessary precondition for action, poor people or citizens more broadly may not take action because there are no institutional mechanisms that demand accountable performance or because the cost of individual action may be too high. Similarly, experience shows that poor people do not participate in activities when they know that their participation will make no difference to products being offered or decisions being made because, they will, because there are no mechanisms for holding providers accountable. Even when they're a strong local organization, they still may be disconnected from local governments and the private sector and lack to access of accurate information. I want to talk about five areas of practice. There are thousands of examples of empowerment strategies that have been initiated by poor people themselves and by governments, civil society, and the private sector. Although there's no single institutional model for empowerment, experience shows that certain elements are almost always present when empowerment efforts actually succeed. 
The five key elements of empowerment that I must underline um, are the following. Number one, access to information. The second, inclusion and participation. The third, accountability. The fourth, local organization capacity, which large, largely has to do with access to resources. And number five, deliberate and focused cohesion between government, private sector, and the CSOs. While these five ele elements are discussed separately, they are so closely intertwined and they act in synergy. In conclusion, I'll simply say the following. Empowerment without multidimensional investment in people and social systems is an act of utter futility. Investment and empowerment are not polar opposites, existing in opposition. I do believe that the balance must be struck by effectively employing the two to achieve two truly democratized power and thus enabling people to thrive on their own terms, in turn ensuring their communities and countries thrive. There needs to be a deliberate commitment for transformation on an individual level for all of us, and in turn seeing it through that we have, we have transformation in how we collaborate and build ecosystems with the people's interests rooted at the very core. The moral of the story is simply that if we're going to win, we're only going to win if we do it together. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. What a wonderful. Thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. It's investment versus empowerment. And uh, we need to invest if you are to empower the community. And one way, UNICAF. Uh, is uh, empowering the community is uh, through scholarships. For example, we have corporate uh, social responsibility scholarship, and um, that is 85 percent. Uh, uh, it's a, a very good uh, example of the investment and empowerment that Unicaf Invest is doing. Um, this time, it's time for questions. May I call? May I call the Pro Vice Chancellor to lead us into this session? Thank you. I <clears throat> want to check time. You see, 11 minutes past 7. So we'll be limited to five questions. And... Um, we would all be happy if we have a participation um, of uh, ladies in the, uh, this phase of uh, the, the presentation. A lady has presented, and this is stimulate questions in the minds of uh, other ladies who are listening. Of course, men will also participate. But can I? Fine. I, 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 I see the hands of uh, uh, women who are uh, who want to ask the first questions. Yes, there's a hand there. Um, you'll be taking. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Provice, for this opportunity of asking questions. Uh, my name is Lerato Masweza. I'm from Lesotho, and I'm a student here at UNICEF University. Uh, my question uh, is, how does we, as UNICEF University, can imply this, can imply this, topic in our daily lives because after graduating you don't want to go and look for a job you want to have your own job so thank you very much um that's the equal participation 
Eman. Yes, over there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, my cloud Guirima. I'm a student here. I'm doing a master's in business administration. Uh, in your presentation, you did actually uh, define the empowerment by uh, stating that uh, Empowerment is about power. That's giving control uh, or making people have influence in wherever they are in the societies they are living. And at the same time, in your presentation, you uh, did give a detailed stati statistics that shows that uh, Africa is receiving a lot of aid money than any other. Uh, in other continent or countries, yes, in the world. So my question is, how does this aid money, uh, what does this aid money do in Africa in relation to your topic, investment versus empowerment? Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Zahir Sheikh, and I live in a long way. I'm an entrepreneur. My question, uh, sorry, first of all, thank you very much for a very beautiful presentation. You've given us a complete insight. However, the question I'd like to ask you, if I put you on the spot, if you were the president of Malawi, I don't understand what investment and empowerment is. What would you do? What uh, would you do as far as Malawi is concerned? I'm interested in Malawi. I'm not interested in Uganda. I'm not interested in Kenya. I'm interested in Malawi. What would you do? Or where do you think the current government is going wrong? And let me put you as the president of Malawi today for this evening for the next 10 minutes when you answer this question and and see at least we will be educated you're a very educated lady you have a lot of experience and I'm dying to learn from you thank you very much so now it's uh, the turn for another lady where are you God Yes, I'm Clara Chimoyazam. Um, my question is, um, I'm, very, I'm very concerned with ladies. Sarah, um, according to your presentation, how can you help the ladies in Malawi? Because as far as uh, we can recall, that when you want to invest, it means that you are, you have money, and you are capable of having uh, knowledge. But according to the percentage that we say there, it simply shows that uh, most of us, most of ladies here, uh, maybe they can have wisdom, yes, but they don't have uh, money or they don't have much knowledge to invest and to empower someone. How can you suggest or how can you enlighten ladies? Where should they do? What should they do? Thank you.
All right. Thank you. My name is uh, Alex Nesagala from uh, Galaxy FM. Uh, my question is so about uh, to do with the youths. Uh, in her presentation, she talked about uh, uh, Malawi uh, having 70% percent, uh, uh, percent to do with the youth. So I wanted to say, uh, to ask to say, has our leaders be able to use power in a right manner? And how best can we empower our future leaders, that's the youth, in making Malawi developed? Because we are always saying or singing to say, the youth are tomorrow's leaders, but we don't empower them to become better leaders when the time comes. Thank you. We have received five questions from the audience. That's the end. We can't go further. Should we? Just um, maybe an extra, extra question. But can I have a lady ask me the question? Yes, over there. At least I'm happy. You are an equalizer. Uh, good evening. My name is Mary. Um, in your presentation, you highlighted that um, a majority of um, people are living below the poverty line, uh, but there are uh, some people who have brilliant um, ideas to start up benches, yet, um, for example, uh, microloan finance institutions require collateral for them to access that. So what do you think is a possible um, solution for such people who are in um, such, um, uh, such environments or such um, states? Thank you. That's the last question. May I now asking Mrs. Linda to take the podium again and answer those six questions. Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much. This is still working. Considering that I'm president for 10 minutes, I'm going to <laughs> really try and enjoy this as much as I can. Um, the first question um, coming from the lady over there was, how can we, as UNICAF University, after graduation, be empowered in investment? I think there was a, another element um, that you added to that as well. Um, anyway, the first thing that came to mind when you asked that question for me was, um, what we're doing here at UNICAF University tonight is extremely important. The, this ecosystem here is very powerful. And once again, in reference to being deliberate about building cohesion, opportunities that are masterminded by UNICAF, such as uh, uh, this gathering this evening, are very key and they mustn't be taken for granted. There are so many people in this room, um, so many ideas, so much power. Um, that if we are all to be deliberate, um, to, 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 you know, to connect and, and to collaborate following um, uh, gatherings like this, already UNICAF is, is spearheading um, a massive movement uh, uh, of positive change as far as power is going, just in that. Um, the second is that um, education remains one of the key pillars of democratizing power because education is the key to information to knowledge and to innovation and that is um, you know an institution that UNICAF that does that and opens that space up in a way that is um, unusual in a way that is very daring is something to be welcomed in my opinion um, an opportunity to interact with um, great thinkers within the country and outside the country um, is, is a new way of looking at innovation and collaboration and building large-scale and small-scale ecosystems um, that can really Im uh, you know, impact on permanent, permanent change. Um, education will always, in my opinion, um, in all its different manifestations, this is an, a, a, a method and mode of education will always remain uh, relevant and powerful. Um, 
So that's that. After graduation, um, how can you be a part of the movement? Um, I talked a little bit about being very deliberate about personal transformation and being change agents as individuals. It is the onus of everybody who wishes to see any sort of change in this world in the next millennia. We all need to be all hands on deck um, and being deliberate about sharing knowledge, about being the change that we want to see, um, and about influencing the various ecosystems that we are part of in a very positive way. So that can be an opportunity that is extended to all of us, not just people looking to graduate, but everyone who, who's alive, really, if they want to maintain that state of being. Uh, the second question was, how does aid money uh, do in Africa in relation to the topic being presented today? Um, I'm going to put you on the spot, McLeod. Um, you worked for a, a development institution, I'm trying to find you, there you are. Um, you worked for an institution that was in the development sector. Um, how are the three ways that money was spent there? And where did it come from? If you don't mind, I'm not pu unless you don't want to answer because, uh, but just to think about it, um, and I think we can all think about this, surely we have interaction on some level with, um, with uh, aid money. Um, just to clarify, I'm not saying aid money is the big bad wolf. I'm saying that all money um, should be taken very seriously. Um, and we should be very uh, deliberate and delicate about thinking about where money comes from, what are the conditions that it comes with, and how is it spent um, at all levels, who spends it, and who decides how money is spent. Um, and I guess that's really the issue. It's about the who decides, isn't it? Um, we're talking about power being democratized, and we're talking about money and finances being um, a very key component of capacity um, and you know, decision making. And so if that is, 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 is that serious and that impactful on people's lives, um, I think I can simply answer by saying that um, these are the things we need to, to think about. Where does money, aid money come from? Um, what are the preconditions? How, um, how is it decided on how it should be spent? And um, what is the, the return on that money? Because I think it would be false to um, ever feel like there are never any attachments to money. It simply isn't true. I'm not sure that there is a silver bullet, but I do think that one of the many things that may need to be considered very seriously is um, once again being deliberate about the policy environment that is created in the country that enables investors, um, people who are engaging in business to thrive. Um, sometimes our policies can be punitive um, and may not, may not in actuality foster and support the growth of, of, of the private sector. Um, I, thank you. I, um, I also think that um, there's a bit of a broken telephone situation as far as that is concerned, is that perhaps policy developers who are most probably uh, government um, individuals, people in the private sector, and the CSOs may not be communicating perhaps as frequently and in the manner that they should be. Um, I don't think there's any any one, any one entity to be vilified in our situation in Malawi at the moment. Um, I think that you know perhaps we may be falling victim to a very long-term lack of, of conversation and we know that all relationships break down when people don't talk. Um, and perhaps maybe this is what is happening um, to us at the moment that is really influencing negatively our trade environment. When we look at the data, first of all, the, the bad news is we're all in trouble, male, female, and otherwise. Um, but uh, particularly, women seem to be getting the shortest end of the stick, and that is just a um, demographic reality. Um, once again, I'm going to talk about ecosystems. Um, perhaps we can, you know, once again, redefine power and leverage the power that we have in ways that we haven't explored currently. And I very much believe in partnership, um, in honest partnership, and in being able to 
really build on other people's um, you know, structure. I think that it's very difficult to succeed as a woman, as a man, as anybody really without, um, without having p collaborators. It's hard to, to scream alone in, into the darkness. Um, and I think that uh, you know, it would be very, um, very powerful um, for women to come together as women, um, to be deliberate about sharing information, to be deliberate about leveraging, um, leveraging power and you know, sharing power as well. There's a lot of power to be gained, as, as we talked about, from being able to share power. Because if there are five of us, and then we share power and redefine power with five more people, then before we know it, there are 500. And that is an unignorable uh, voice um, that, is loud, that will speak very loudly. Uh, rather than the five of us whispering quietly together. So I think that that might be one of the many ways um, that women can, can um, cohesively leverage their power and, 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 and push themselves forward. I was once asked the question, I was once asked to respond to the question rather, um, when, when you hear the figures of, uh, the demographic figures of the youthful population of Malawi, does it make you panic? Actually it doesn't. I am extremely excited Never in the world have we ever had such a force of young, vigorous individuals. This is not a cause for panic, in my opinion. This is an opportunity like we've never had before in the history of mankind. Um, in regards to the relationship between older leaders and younger leaders, I think that there's, there is an importance in ensuring you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say, pretty much. Um, I think, once again, it's a matter of cohesion. Let's learn from each other. What are the mistakes that have been made in the past? What are the opportunities that have been missed? What are the things that we need to change? Um, power, um, I hope I mentioned this, is also trans transitory. It, it metamorphosizes over time. Um, the baton of leadership in one form must be passed on um, as the current president in this ca capacity has so kindly endowed to me tonight. This is not something I, have, I can hold on to. I shouldn't, because I will stifle everybody in this place. The baton of leadership must change to allow me to also transform. And that's one way in which perhaps leaders of different ages in different sectors need to regard the issue of power as a wonderful thing that grows ever more brighter as it transforms. Um, the, 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 you know, the figures are undeniable. Um, yes, 50% of our young people are under the age of 20. Um, there's not a lot of space in Malawi. Um, we currently have you know, mass unemployment. Um, and this is, now we're not even talking about young people that haven't had the opportunity to uh, access secondary or tertiary education. Um, these are you know, young people who have access to tertiary education. Everyone, <coughs> as far as um, this current model, is, is potentially in, in quite a bit of trouble. Um, and once again, I'll make reference to the fact that I, I believe that transformation is our most powerful tool of survival. When something doesn't work or doesn't work in one form, um, everyone needs to be brought to the table and be asked, can we try something? Can we try something else? Um, and that's OK. It doesn't mean that we failed. It means that we are, we are ready, we are receptive. And we're committed to, to doing the right thing. Um, more voices need to be brought to the table. It is futile to teach fish and assess them on how good they are at climbing trees. Fish don't climb trees. Um, and our education system needs to be as diverse and as multifaceted as, as possible to accommodate all of the different people who we really, really do need. Um, to, to bring on board, because there's a lot of work to do. I'm sure you've seen, somebody mentioned that there's no electricity at my house right now. And that is something that is an opportunity. It's, uh, it's an opportunity to innovate, an opportunity to look at new solutions. <coughs> it isn't a cause for panic. Um, it's, it's an exciting time to put the, spread the word and say, we're looking for new ideas, and we are daring, and we're willing to try. Uh, and that makes us brave if anything. Uh, even uh, the lecturing, the question has come to an end. Mine is just uh, a suggestion. 
most most of the times when uh, questions when you give us I, I mean time to ask questions you take five questions I think there's a problem because we need you have to balance the things or so at least if you could allow three ladies and three gentlemen and uh, yeah we know you do everything according to time but we need we ask next time to extend um, the question time thank you thank you so much I will not take a, uh, your time but uh, I came a little bit late so I'm not really sure whether what I will say has already been mentioned but uh, there's something wrong with our education system I think that has been already been mentioned because I think there are three questions that we really need to understand and you have to ask the first question is where are we coming from where are we and where are we going I think these are the three questions which our education system has to address we don't need banking education where we just educate people in things which will not help them. We have to educate people so that they know who they are, where they're coming from. We may blame a lot of things. We may blame politicians. But the question is, uh, what we have to focus is where we are coming from. For instance, the problem is if we, you don't know where you're coming from, you will not know where you are and you will not know where, you, where you're going. So I think our education system has to address this question, I mean these three questions, so that we raise the consciousness of the youth, so that we have to really know, because if, you really, if your, your consciousness is raised, that's when you will know yourself. Because if you know yourself, if you know where you're coming from, where you're going and where you are, then you'll be able to contribute to your country. Because you know yourself what you have to do for your country. But if you're just educated in just knowledge which will not help you, which will not raise your consciousness, then you're not doing anything. Because our education, we usually aim at uh, helping students or individuals to get employed. So you get them employed, yes, but they don't know who they are. They don't know where they're coming from and where they're going. So we miss, we are, there's a lot that has to be done, actually. It's next time I'll come so that we really have to discuss this. But thank you so much for, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ahmed Ibrahim Milazi. I am uh, a senior software engineer at uh, National Integrated Technologies, and I am also an MBA student here at UNICAF University. Mine is a simple question uh, to the just ended talk. I am sorry that uh, I am bringing the speaker back to the podium. Um, most of the questions that were raised have, of course, been about um, the topic uh, that the, the speaker brought um, and with a little about our country. Uh, mine is about uh, the organization. Is it Tingate? What can we, uh, one, as the audience here, uh, two, as the citizens of this country who live in Lilongwe, and three, as a country, do to help Tingate. And what, and what challenges is Tingate facing, uh, which you feel maybe internally at Tingate, uh, you are failing to solve them, uh, which maybe you would want uh, others to come in and say, okay. Uh, because here, we have very experienced people. If you saw the list, they are CEOs, they are entrepreneurs, okay. Uh, I think people from various private uh, and public sectors uh, who can also join hands, not only in thought, okay, but in also experience to say, okay, that particular problem you have, as we solved it like this. And lastly, 
Uh, we have seen in your profile that you have helped train over 100 individuals uh, in creating what you term as wealth that sticks. So uh, what impact of this activity that you have been doing in your NGO have you so far observed uh, on our economy or do you think that you need more time to start observing the impact? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, though I closed the session, but it looks like it's an academic environment where we have uh, so much things to speak. Uh, there are two, three questions. The first two questions, I think the provost chancellor would, would take them. And the last question, the presenter would take it. Thank you. Thanks very much for the extra questions. I think we will uh, first take the third question, uh, which is uh, addressed to the presenter. So may I ask her to take the podium again, just to answer that one question. The other question, we will try to, 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 to respond to that. So you'll be with me here so that I protect you and so that n no other questions come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. I feel quite safe uh, with you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the great question. Um, so, in a nutshell, I think um, this is one of, one of the fated pictures that never came up. But anyway, um, this is an illustration, well, it's not an illustration, it's a picture actually of um, our young people in the carpentry and joinery program. So they're doing some of their practicals here. But um, yes, what we do at Dingate is to, you know, we hope to build wealth that sticks in partnership um, with young people as individuals, communities at peri-urban level, and the society at large at a national level. Um, and we do this in, in three ways with our Dingate training program is we engage young people in holistic vocational training. Um, so why the wealth that sticks is because beyond training young people in a vocation like carpentry and joinery, fashion and design, uh, beauticianry or bricklaying, we also equip them with skills in financial literacy, business management, but also leadership, personal leadership, community leadership, uh, sexual reproductive health knowledge, human rights knowledge, because really what we're trying to do is to give young people, be deliberate about giving young people an opportunity to bring out the champion from themselves. We don't believe that we are actually doing anything that resembles waving a magic wand or filling empty buckets, but we're just giving young people permission to explore all their power um, and expand that power by uh, sharing their knowledge and their experience with their community, by being integral in the financial upliftment of their communities and their families and themselves as individuals and taking um, a key role in, um, in changing the economic and social landscape of the country. Um, which is why, I mean, uh, cohesion, ecosystem are, you know, buzzwords, but we like them better than empowerment because they actually work. Um, so these are the young people that we, we work with. We work with these young people. We work with their parents. We work with their younger siblings in the ECD program. We work with the chiefs. We work with business people, um, such as yourselves, who come in as mentors for our young people post-program. Um, and so we really are trying to you know, position ourselves as a catalyst. Um, our center is a place where we bring people together deliberately. So um, one way that perhaps if you would like to be involved or anyone else, is in our mentorship program uh, where we invite uh, people from all walks of life who um, are willing to give their time to mentor our young people. Um, two of our mentors are here. Jeff is, uh, is one of our mentors. Jeff, oh, Jeff, go on. <laughs> There's Jeff Gelvard, and Jeff is also our technical advisor, and he does that on a voluntary capacity, um, which, um, which we're very blessed to have. Um, 
very blessed to have Jeff, but um, that's one of the ways that uh, people get involved with uh, what we are doing with the young people, um, especially in the Dandelion Center. Um, one of the other ways is to, um, to spread the story. Um, we hope to infect as many people with the kind of joy and um, enthusiasm we have for young people, the kind of belief we have in innovation, the kind of belief we have that young people can build wealth um, and not just survive but thrive um, and we can prove that model uh, by telling you a little story um, I can tell you two stories I'll tell you one about a young man called Jeremiah um, and the first time we met this young man he was a custodian of a pistol in a gang from Dandiri um, and as we speak young, right now his trousers are now worn s several inches higher than they used to be um, he no longer um, is the custodian of this pistol and he works at Madidi Lodge. Uh, he completed his course in hospitality and service management and he's rising up the ranks. So that's one example. Um, another example is uh, Rose, uh, who was a stay-at-home mother um, at the age of 25. Uh, she hadn't had the opportunity to finish secondary school because she had lost her parents. Um, she was earning income from selling uh, produce, tomatoes, onions, um, a maximum of perhaps 12,000 kwacha a month in profit. Um, and as we speak, she has exponentially increased her income to by 200%, um, simply because the conversation started with, Rose, what do you do and what do you like to do? And she said, well, I sell tomatoes. And I said, but you don't answer the question. What do you want to do? What do you like to do? And she said, I like to make things. I like to create, I like to make shoes, I like to make jewelry. And we said, well, that's what we're going to do. And that's what she does. And she makes all sorts of things and she sells and she has a shop now and she's increased her in income exponentially. And she's able to invest in the health care of her children, in their education. She's now building a home. And that's, that's how I, I would like to describe our income, not as figures because these are not figures, they're people, they're real people.